Jessica Wade. I've been an editor at Ace Books for 15 years. It's a division of the Berkeley Publishing Group, which is part of Penguin Random House. I feel really lucky to be here today to talk with four incredibly talented authors as part of Penguin Random House's Book Your Summer Live. Thank you all so much for joining me for the Modern Mythology panel. I have some questions prepared and I'll start off the discussion, but I have asked the authors to please feel free to jump in and make it conversational. I know this is going to be a fun and informative chat. So, modern mythology. Myths are foundational stories that have survived for thousands of years in rich oral and written traditions around the world. They have lots of purposes. To, to inform, to entertain, to explore morality, to explain otherwise totally unexplainable things, sometimes to lay the groundwork for society's religious beliefs or catalog, catalog legendary events so they're never forgotten. They very often feature the machinations of gods and goddesses who are often very poorly behaved and the mortals who interact with them. These ancient stories continue to have tons of resonance today. And that's why on this panel, you'll get to meet four writers who have interwoven with myth with their very modern works. So first of all, the basics. I would love to have all the panelists introduce themselves and just say a little bit about their work and also their most recent or soonest upcoming work that features mythology and also to make their editors and publicists happy to tell the audience at home where, when they can acquire those works. So I guess we could go with, could we start out with, I'm just looking at my screen, we'll start out with Genevieve. Um. Hi, I'm Genevieve Gornacek, and my debut novel is The Witch's Heart. It's a reimagining of Norse mythology from the point of view of uh, the giantess Angerboda, who is the mother of three very peculiar children by Loki. And it is out on February 9th, 2021, uh, although an ex excerpt of it will be posted on the Book Your Summer Live page for download. Then let's go to Nikita. Oh, hello. Um, I, I'm Nikita Gill, and I mainly write poetry. Uh, the book which I have currently written is a novel in verse called The Girl and the Goddess, which follows the life of this young girl from living in a, um, a relatively war-torn area and um, the visits that she constantly gets from the Hindu gods and the goddesses in particular. Um, and this book will be out on the... 30th of September, or the 29th of September. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to get into trouble for that. That's fine. <laughs> um, let's go to Kevin next. Well, hi, uh, I'm Kevin Hearn, and I'm the author of the Iron Druid Chronicles and the Seven Kennings trilogy. And uh, the Iron Druid Chronicles obviously uh, deals with Druidry out of Ireland and the Tua de Danon. Uh, the pagan Irish gods. And uh, that continues in my upcoming work, Ink and Sigil, which will be out uh, later this month on August 25th, just a couple of weeks away. And uh, that continues to uh, feature the Irish pantheon as well as some others. Cool. And Kiming, bring us home. Hi, I'm honored to be here. Um, my name is Kaming. Um, I'm the author, I have it here actually, of Bestiary, although my background might be kind of um, interrupting that image, um, which comes out on September 29th. Um, it's about three generations of Taiwanese American women um, and the youngest of the family, who's a girl who grows a tiger tail overnight, um, which connects her to a myth about a tiger spirit. Um, and so she has to kind of excavate her family history in order to um, understand the root of this tale. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Those are great introductions. Uh, let's take it back to the beginning for the first question. So what was the first time that you remember being introduced to myth or mythology? Was it something that was passed down to you and your family as an oral tradition? Like for example, in bestiary, I know there's a really strong tradition of mothers telling tales to their daughters and that kind of changing the fabric 
of reality. So was it an oral tradition or was it, um, you know, a book that you took over from, out from the library over and over again or a video game you played? Where did you first encounter myth? I think you're going to have to pick on someone. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, you know, great. The, the online panel. Any, any, who would like to go? Anyone. Uh, who feels like they have an answer ready? I, I've got one. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I first encountered it in comic books for, uh, which, of course, has very little to do with actual Norse mythology. Um, so, uh, well, I mean, the names are correct, but, uh, you know, Thor was not really a blonde, and uh, so on and so forth. Their little details are a bit different, but it did get me interested in uh, seeking out the original myths. And then uh, later on, I got the you know typical diet that almost every kid gets in America of the Greco-Roman pantheon. Uh, sadly, we didn't get a lot else. There's there's so much else out there, and there's you know that you have to seek out on your own. You have to get outside the system to go see stuff that's you know different and interesting. So um, I, I eventually wound up doing that in college. But uh, you know I, I had uh, the same sort of introduction. Maybe almost anybody gets in, in America the sort of limited diet of mythology that you you get uh, in the typical schools. Okay. Yeah, I can go. Um, I think for me, like similar to what you said, it's um, oral storytelling is a huge tradition in my family, especially with mothers and daughters. Um, and for me, I think it was an attempt to kind of put us to sleep um, where we would, I was like in my grandma's house and I was sharing a bed with my mom and my brother. Um, and I'm a very like twitchy, <laughs> I was a very twitchy, high energy child. Um, and I'm sure sharing the same bed, my mom was like, she needs to sleep. Like, we need to <laughs> put her down to sleep right now. Um, and so she would tell these stories um, that kind of unraveled and became increasingly, like, kind of complex um, as she told them. Um, and they're supposed, they were, I think they were supposed to lull us, but they were, like, very violent um, or very intense or had lots of, like, dark humor and often had, you know, like, predatory animals and like bodily transformations and all of these things that um, didn't seem like they were for children, but which is what I loved about myth is that there was no differentiation between like what a child was supposed to hear versus what an adult was supposed to hear. Um, and that was something I really loved. Um, and also it was so embodied because it was like oral storytelling. Um, there wasn't like the sense, oh, there's a canonical text, an authorita authoritative text that you have to adhere to. Um, it was very much up to the, the teller to kind of reinvent that myth, um, which I loved, yeah. Nikita? Uh, yeah, uh, I was just going to say actually what, uh, uh, what Kaming said really resonated because my mom told me a lot of stories growing up. My grandmother actually was the person who gave the whole family like lots and lots of stories but in india there's also this because hinduism is still a very widely practiced religion um the pantheon and the stories that are behind it um they become even more interesting there's like three million hindu gods right so to go into like searching into that pantheon you have to really pull up away layers and layers and layers of ancient stories which give way to lessons because most of those stories, they revolve around a, a, a lesson, a dharma, um, and, and you know, they revolve around karma as well, which is like what you do in this life. Um, it, it dictates what your next life will be because there's a belief in reincarnation. So it's, there's so much there to play with and to explore. Um, I feel like, you know, there's, uh, when I first came into it, that was how I did it. My grandmother would tell me the stories and then my mom would take me to the mandir or the temples to pray. And so there was that, you know, there was the connection of religion plus myth together and stories. So yeah, that's how I came into it. Genevieve? I came into it because of a mixture of Disney's Hercules, which came out when I was a child and uh, that caused me to pick up this flimsy little chapter book that was a Greek myth retelling that was at the Scholastic Book Fair. Um, and from there, I, you know, would kind of read other mythologies. I read a couple of Norse mythology, like 
you know, books that were geared a little bit more towards kids. And it wasn't until college where I took a class on Old Norse where uh, my interest really started to perk and I was able to read some of the stories like in their original language, which was super cool. So that's, uh, that's how I came to get into mythology. Cool, that's great. Thanks everyone. So um, you guys have all chosen to incorporate mythology and you've written stories that if not in the modern world that are modern works created for modern readers. So why do you think that mythology, um, you know, obviously there are areas where, where uh, what one would call mythology is the basis for an act of religion. But in terms of ancient myths, why do you think they resonate so strongly with readers today? And whoever wants to go first can, you know, read <laughs> your finger. Anyone? Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Um, I think the reason why mythology and also kind of fairy tales, they resonate so much is because they've been passed down orally and they're ancient, but they, I think everyone has a basis, like somewhat of a basis in these tales, like every single mythology, which I've studied, it holds some threads that connect another mythology which I know, so there's a lot of similarities between Greek and Hin the Greek and Hindu pantheon in regards to how they interact with mortals, for instance, the fact that there are um, so many epic poems and the stories being told by poets. And I feel like that tradition of telling these stories, um, that's something because all we're made of at the end is these stories, like our stories and the stories that are given to us. And I think mythology, because they are almost ancient stories, that's why they resonate till date. Um. Yeah, I think, yeah, similar to also what Nikita was saying before too about how often myth is tied to like morality um, and values and what we want to quote unquote teach or pass down, especially to young people. Um, I think there's so much like subversive possibility in mythology and retelling it and how it is kind of like our way of kind of rewriting our world and our society as well. Um, through these myths. And I think that's why they continue to be retold and reshaped and, you know, changing as well. Um, because there is so much, it's like so bound to um, like different, yeah, so bound to like morality and things like that. And I think also the desire to subvert those things, um, I think are still always present with us too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's really fascinating too, that there are so many, like not only like moral um, archetypes, but like character archetypes that still resonate with us, like the trickster character. Um, just the fact that like they were still telling stories about characters like this, like thousands of years ago, is just, it's so cool. <laughs> yeah, all these uh, gods and goddesses, uh, whether they're worshipped today or, or not, um, they represent, you know, key parts of our own existence. You have goddesses of uh, love and wisdom and so on and and, and, and of course there's war etc and all of these things are still just as relevant today as they were back then so uh, basically telling a story in myth now uh, means that uh, we get to uh, see ourselves but also maybe take a step back and and maybe it's not so personal because now the story is about somebody else from another time but we, it allows us to connect ourselves to the past and, and root ourselves in the present. So, uh, yeah. Well, I will say that, um, Kamen, you have led me to one of my other questions, which is directed to Nikita, so she can go first, but, um, but everyone else can chime in. So I watched a great TED talk that you gave um, about, uh, mythology and you had a great line which was that you were saying that you like to change the lens when you write from the perspective of women and who are mentioned maybe more briefly in this um, and you said all of the female characters from mythology that I bring back I give them permission to disobey and to be themselves so what are aspects of ancient mythology that you're always looking to sort of deliberately subvert and insert for effect into modern tales? Um, I think what's really interesting about that is, so the last book I wrote uh, was on Greek mythology and it um, 
you know, uh, Great Goddesses did this whole thing where it specifically spoke predominantly from the perspective of um, the goddesses, but also from the monsters and the mortals. And the only thing which I basically did was I gave them the capability of telling the story because I've noticed, um, especially with Greek myth and sometimes with Hindu myth as well, the stories are written and told by men. And because of that, the autonomy which should be given to a lot of female characters, it becomes very two-dimensional. They're not given the, um, the credence that they deserve. And a lot of Greek mythology, when I was pulling it apart, felt a lot like it was about punishing women. Like women got petty and women did this and women, and of course, we're looking at some of the actions of the, the male gods in the stories and they, they get to be nuanced. Their actions have like, even their cruel actions have reasons behind them. But the women gods didn't get as much of a... Um, uh, they weren't treated with as much nuance. Like people would just turn around and go, oh, Hera is just evil. You know, or Aphrodite can be so evil. And it's just like, yeah, but you have to look at why they act that way. So by giving these characters the capability of telling the story from how they see it, you're, I basically felt like I was asking me, my audience the question, well, what would you do? You know, if you were in my shoes, what would you do? And that's the whole point of doing a feminist retelling is like you take someone who's villainized, a character who's villainized, and you just let them tell the story. And suddenly people realize that, oh, wait a minute. Am I, are they the villain? Or is that just how the other person saw them? Is that the heroic character or the person we're supposed to see as the hero? Is that just how they saw them? So it, it's, it's basically telling people that there's so many different perspectives to the tale. And, you know, don't always trust the first one, basically. <laughs> yeah, wow, that really resonates with me. Um, it makes me think a lot about how um, oftentimes when I was reading about Chinese mythology or about the Chinese supernatural world, whoever was kind of marginalized in society or seen as like not belonging in society were instantly fox spirits, you know, Hui Jing or snake spirits, or it was because they were possessed by something. Um, and I think this is also common in Western mythology too, of like, oh, um, queer folks or marginalized people, oh, it's because they're a fox spirit. Like they're, they're seductive or they're monstrous or they can drain you kind of like a succubus. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was really interested in what does it mean to kind of like reclaim these margins um, and kind of see, like empower <laughs> these like supernatural spirits in a way and like subvert that narrative or to see it as um, I don't know, like generative, uh, like full of potential and not just, and that like kind of in being exiled from the human world that there's also a kind of power in that too. Um, and yeah, and so I was like super interested in, in that idea too of like, what does it mean for the monsters to speak? Um, and why, why do we categorize, <laughs> categorize them as monsters? Um, yeah. Um, I, I, to expand a little bit on, on what Nikita was saying, uh, there is quite a bit of cross-cultural um, dialogue, I guess, between uh, you know Greek and Roman mythology and a bunch of others, um, and and there's some even with the Irish pantheon. Uh, there's uh, Flittish, uh, a huntress, who is in every way like Artemis and Diana except for one key difference. And it, it was uh, where I, Artemis and Diana were virgin goddesses, Flittish was not. She was uh, very uh, sexually free. And it, it basically demonstrated that Irish pagan culture was much more comfortable with women's sexuality, with women holding power. You had many, many goddesses who were very powerful and did whatever the heck they want and nobody had a problem with it. And, you know, the patriarchy got established with St. Patrick, you know, and so mm -hmm. that kind of ended. But in, in pagan Irish culture, there's this very strong, um, you know, feminist uh, tradition and it, by telling that and bringing that back, I, I actually did not need to subvert anything. I just told it like it was. And it was already subversive by, you know, some people's standards as is, just because they were a little bit different um, from the uh, sort of patriarchal uh, societies of Europe. Amazing. 
I feel like a lot of times, uh, I feel like Norse mythology has kind of been, be, become known for its like strong women and like shield maidens. And really like if, if you look at the source material, like so many women are just mentioned and then never heard from again. Like we only have like one or two goddesses who actually do something. So um, like picking a, a random side woman and kind of like telling her story, especially since she is the mother of monsters, um, was kind of my way of subverting that. Um, and kind of giving her a voice. So, yeah, I agree with all of you. <laughs> I had never really thought about that before. I, uh, that's awesome point, thank you. Um, I, I, Cause I do recall seeing a whole bunch of goddesses mentioned and their strength in, you know, character being lauded, but then you're right, they kind of, they kind of disappear. So mm -hmm. that, thank you, that's a really good point. Thanks. Um, Here's a really important question. Which god or goddess from any pantheon would be the best quarantine buddy that you can imagine and or the worst quarantine buddy that you can imagine? You just can't get away from them. You're stuck in the house with them. <laughs> oh god, I don't think I want to be quarantined with any of them. Yeah, I was like, that seems like a very bad idea. <laughs> Very temperamental and unpredictable. Um, though I just thought of someone who I actually write about in the book, um, who Mazu, who is the, a goddess of the sea, and one of her interesting powers, or kind of how she became a goddess, she can project herself, like she can astrally project herself in dreams. So she'll be like asleep at home, but her dream body will be like sailing around rescue, rescuing sailors um, or doing whatever she wants. And I was like, oh, that's actually kind of perfect because you could be at home and then astrally project <laughs> um, kind of your dream self um, wherever um, and kind of be simultaneously in multiple places. Um, and then maybe all of our astral projections could be together in a, in a panel. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so mostly we can think of a lot of very bad quarantine. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say Loki for best and worst quarantine buddy because you might get really annoyed, but you'd never get bored. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think for me, it's definitely Saraswati because she's the goddess of wisdom and knowledge. So she'd just be this font of like wisdom and knowledge that I would just go and like learn from. And I definitely think the worst one would be Zeus. Yeah. Like, I just say, oh, you don't want to be quarantined <laughs> with that guy. Just come on. <laughs> uh. um, I, I think uh, there's an Irish god of brewing named Govnu, who was apparently quite uh, an amenable fellow and uh, happy to share his craft with you. So I think uh, it would be just a lot of home brewing uh, going on, and uh, that would be okay. That sounds great. <laughs> um, Kevin. In your delightful series opener, Ink and Sigil, you have a scene, and I hope this is not a spoiler, I'm sure they can edit, edit it out, where your main character has to babysit a mythological creature, and he comes home and finds that the mythological creature has figured out how to work Netflix and streamed all of Lord of the Rings and is extremely concerned about you know which fey plane this is taking place on and where he can go to help out and, and defeat so the pro protagonist has to explain that it's entertainment and it's very funny. Um, do you think that there is always humor to be found when ancient beings are taken from mythology and find themselves in modern times? And what do you think you get out of that tension of a mythological person walking around in the modern world or meeting with modern sensibilities? Uh, yeah, I, I, I always... Uh... I've tried to write serious stuff and I, and, I, and I can kind of sort of pull it off, but I always wind up being a little humorous anyway, because I, I keep finding humorous things just to, as part of everyday life. And I think by bringing somebody into our modern world who's unfamiliar with it, um, they're allowed to express the utter confusion that we often feel ourselves and they can do it freely, whereas we're supposed to be cool with, with, you know, with everything. This is just the way things are and it's normal. But we often feel that it's not normal and it shouldn't be this way, but we don't feel that we can say that out loud. And, you know, these characters from mythology, when you put them in our world, they can say it out loud. And then you have to, you have to say out loud 
why things are the way they are. And then you realize how ridiculous some of our society is. So I, I think that they bring a lot to the table just because they can be sort of, you know, the straight man if it was a comedy routine. And mm. uh, you're allowed to explore a lot of things that otherwise might never come up. So. And that's, oh, and the character, by the way, is a hobgoblin. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, that, that's fine. Uh, the hobgoblin comes and uh, has a lot of questions about how things work. So it's a lot of fun. Anyone else or I have another one? Um, so um, animals are really important in lots of mythology and as the author of this year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how have you guys? Have you? How have you all played with um, with animal um, symbolism and actual animals in mythology in your works? <laughs> Anyone? I uh, uh, so I'm a crazy cat lady. Uh, which, you know, <laughs> my, my cat's probably going to show up and try and interrupt this because he always does. Um, but yeah, one of, the, one of the biggest things and my favorite poems that I wrote in my last book was um, uh, Argos, so Odysseus's dog. And it always really bothered me in the Odyssey that, and I hope I'm not spoiling the Odyssey for anyone. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> But it really bothered me that when he comes back and I get that he's in a disguise and everything and his old hunting dog, Argos, is, is, is there and he is, you know, he's old and all he's waited for for 10 years or for 20 years is for his master to just come back and just to, you know, say hello. And he sees him and he recognizes him. He wags his tail and Odysseus walks past him because he knows that'll give his disguise away. And then he just dies, the dog dies. And I was like, absolutely not. This is, I, I, so it was one of the stories which I really wanted to change. So I told the poem from the perspective of, um, yeah, so I told the poem from the perspective of the dog. And I found that that probably was my favorite poem because animals can't speak. So being able to tell a story from the perspective of an animal is really, is a really unusual and interesting experience. So yeah, well, that was one of the uh, one of the um, characters or one of the animals in my book, which meant a lot. Yeah, I think for me, it's really interesting to think about how in mythology, the boundaries between the human and the animal are not very clearly defined. Um, I feel like across all mythologies, humans turn into animals, animals turn into people, um, animal spirits um, can kind of traverse um, across different bodies. And I think this idea that like humans are, you know, the elevated in some way above animals is like a fairly recent idea um, and maybe even a fairly re like Eurocentric or colonial idea and that a lot of the mythology that I research, there is this sense of kind of reverence um, or this idea that, you know, and before you kill an animal or when you kill an animal, you pay respect to it, um, you pray to, to it, to its spirit. Um, and yeah, and I was really interested in the idea of like, oh, what does it mean to kind of claim this, reclaim this indigenous Taiwanese mythology that very much gives, um, that has a kind of reverence uh, towards animals. Um, and also just like kind of the playfulness and inexplicability of the ways that humans and animals can turn into each other and like the mutability between all those boundaries, um, I thought was just something really playful to play with as well. Um, yeah, those are my, <laughs> my thoughts. Yeah. That's so cool. Genevieve, like, talk about the boundaries between um, humans and animals. My main character gives birth to two sons who are a wolf and a snake. <laughs> communicate telepathically. Um, and they, it's interesting that those were the animals that, like, that, that she gave birth to and not, like, kittens or puppies. Like, these are both two very, like, dangerous animals and would have been dangerous to humans, like, back then and now. So, like, I guess, like, what do we think about like dangerous animals and like how, what is that trying to say about the character and their parents? I love talking animals. They are, <laughs> they're also very appealing, I have to say. 
I do too. Um, I have a talking dog, although it's a telepathic connection with the Druid um, in my Iron Druid Chronicles. And it, I've wound up, uh, you know, writing a few novellas from the point of view of the dog, uh, which was, as Nikita said, a, a lot of fun, very different, and uh, wound up being kind of my favorite thing to uh, put myself in, in that particular headspace. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, we, we all sort of long to have a, a closer connection uh, with animals and um, sometimes feel that that connection is already there and very close. And then sometimes we feel this wide chasm and uh, fiction can uh, help us appreciate all of it. Mm -hmm. That is great. And I feel like someone needs to do a reclaiming mythology from the animal's point of view anthology. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so Genevieve, earlier you touched a little on the fact that your uh, main character is someone who's mentioned, you know, very little in the sources you were looking at. So is that something that you find to be freeing or difficult? And how do you go about researching when you are trying to find information on someone who is not mentioned a lot? And for all of you, how do you go about researching the mythology you incorporate into your stories? So that is a great question. Um, basically, I took what we knew about this character from her, you know, two mentions in the source material and tried to make connections with other, you know, like female figures in the mythology and then kind of connected those dots and then wrote a whole story beginning to end and kind of like, it, it kind of filled everything in. So um, that, and, and it's not the same for like every one of the Norse goddesses or uh, female deities in the mythology. It's just that Angerboda started off with those associations with wolves and snakes, and it kind of went from there. You know, what other figures might have these associations? And then if you draw a line from point A to point B, what does point B have in common with other pit figures? And then you make this web and it's like, whoa, I could tell the story of Norse mythology from beginning to end using just this one character. So that was the method to my madness. Nikita, how about you? How do you go about your research? Oh, uh, first I panic and cry. Um, <laughs> 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 um, no, but, but seriously, I, I think the thing is uh, for me, for both books, it's been quite different. So for my Greek mythology book, I went back to um, a whole bunch of stuff which I had read before, which was this um, book that my mom had sent me, which was the connections between the Greek and the Hindu gods, which was written by a author called Devdat Patnaik, um, who was an amazing mythologist in India. And then after that, I kind of went into looking at the cultural stuff, which I had really enjoyed as a child, like Sandman by, by Neil Gaiman. Um, and I looked at why I had enjoyed that, because what Neil Gaiman does is like, it's either none of them exist or all of them exist. And that he does that in American Gods as well. And I found that really fascinating as an idea. Um, and, and that's where like great goddesses came from. But for this one, for Girl and Goddess, it was very much going back to my family and sitting down with them and hearing every single version of theirs, how they came into mythology and taking the books from them. And then looking at the retellings that they heard growing up. And it's just been like, old dusty books sitting with my grandmother like you know cross-legged on the floor and just like learning from that and I think that in itself was not just a research experience it was also reconnecting with with the elders in the family which is really big in my culture and it's so important and I think all of that came together to create this book um, so yeah that's how I did the research for this particular book. Cool. Kiming, how about you? Yeah, no, that really resonates with me. I think for me, I did very little formal research. A lot of it was just storytelling and listening to and absorbing and transcribing um, the stories that my family told me. And then also I would kind of cross check by doing a lot of Googling. Like there was one detail um, from the story that I remembered about the tiger spirit, which is that she ate like toes, but she called them peanuts. And I thought that was so bizarre and also really funny in a way and so I googled it and it was like a real detail that somebody had wrote, written down on a very like official website and I was like that is so strange I thought this was just like a personality quirk of my family enjoying peanuts or something um, and also in kind of cross-referencing and checking I was really overwhelmed by the versions of stories like how many different versions there were 
But at the same time, I thought it was so um, fascinating because um, a lot of the, these gods are their bodhisattvas. And so if you read like different Buddhist texts, that I realized, oh, it's the same God in every, in all of these different um, countries, but by different names, but they're the same, they're the same figure that came out of these like kind of same foundations. I um, mean, I feel like that gave me, that liberated me in a lot of ways and gave me freedom to alter stories as well, because it is an immigration story in my book. Um, and so I was like, oh, what does it mean? Like all these gods and goddesses have kind of crossed borders and become and change depending on what country they were in or what, um, like dynasty. Um, and so I was like, oh, what would it mean for then um, to kind of have these stories mimic that immigration too and the ways in which their stories have changed and evolved and what they mean is now different in this completely new context. Um, so yeah, I just thought it was so fascinating. <laughs> uh, okay, for, for my research, um, I the, the unique thing or the weird thing, I guess, about Druids, the, the old ones anyway, not, not the new ones that were basically kind of a, uh, a revival that happened during the Victorian period, but the ancient Druids never wrote anything down. So what we have are, is this combination of things. There's the archaeological record, um, but again, nothing really written. And then there's um, also stories that were written down during the Christian era. Of, about pagan Ireland. So on the one hand, they are at least Irish Christians who are writing it down and probably trying to preserve uh, some of the stories uh, of pagan times, but you also have to realize that they are writing this through a Christian filter and probably not being as generous or as accurate mm -hmm. as, you know, an actual Druid or, uh, you know, might be. And this is a similar thing that happened with Norse mythology. A lot of the Norse stuff uh, was was written down by folks later on. Um, so what I had to do was then take the the stuff that the Irish Christians wrote, then compare it with other sources, like uh, the Greeks uh, had come in and, and, and written some stuff, and then the archaeological record and figure things out, what was most likely, what was consistent between all these different narratives. And one was that Druids could shapeshift into animals. And another was that they had some form of weather control, you know, limited. Yeah, uh, and then uh, there was uh, like limited as in fog banks or something like that. Then there was um, this idea persistently that they could teleport. And I was like, wow, that's, that's fascinating. Okay, how did they manage that? And so, you know, I took all of that stuff and then kind of tried to incorporate it into my Druids and then come up with a magic system that would make all of it work together. So that's what I got to do. Um, you know, so the, the beauty of it, I guess, is that nobody can really say I'm wrong <laughs> because there's no, there's no uh, actual uh, text to uh, basically contradict me, but you know, everybody is understanding that this is really uh, based on a hodgepodge of stuff and there's no really genuine primary source material when it comes to the Druid Reed. And it seems like, Kevin, you might have visited a pub or two in the name of research for your newest book as well. Yeah, I went to Glasgow for that. Uh, for Ink and Sigil, I, I did a, a lot of location scouting in Glasgow, and uh, it was fascinating, a wonderful city. Um, when folks talk about Scotland, they usually are talking about the Highlands or Edinburgh, but Glasgow has its own character, and I really enjoyed it, and, and I hope folks are going to dig it when it comes out. Um, I am going to ask you all, I hope you don't mind, um, even though this is a mythology specific panel, I know that a lot of people who, um, who are watching this panel will probably want to hear sort of general writing questions, if that's okay. Um, so I just want to run through a, a couple with you all. Um, and it's interesting because you all come from such, um, different traditions, like, Kimming, I know you're a poet as well, and Kita's a poet. Um, so here are, here are a couple of questions that are more generic um, writing and authorship questions. Um, so Kimming and Genevieve, you are both debut novelists. And I was wondering if you could tell us what are the things that you're most excited about um, when your debut novel comes out, and Nikita and Kevin, if you remember what the thing that you were most excited about before your first book came out, you could share that too. Genevieve, I'm calling on you. Okay. <laughs> um, 
I am really excited um, about like engaging with people about Norse mythology in general because I really love the subject and I've read so many different interpretations of all of the gods and goddesses and giants and like all of the all the characters in Norse mythology so it's gonna be really interesting to like see how people react to my interpretation and like have a dialogue about that so I'm 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 nervous about the reception, but I'm also really excited. So I guess that's 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 what I'm getting at. Yeah, my assignment is really similar. I think finally like engaging with people about these things that have been in my head for so long and also my for my family to see it too, um, and to realize that their stories have been kind of um I don't know, uh <laughs> centered in this way, I think is really important for me. Um yeah, I I think yeah, similarly, just like engaging in dialogue. Um, and I started thinking like, I was like, oh, I'm really tired of hearing my own words. <laughs> like, I'm really like, I feel like no one wants to hear me read anything. But like, what if we like used clamshells to commune with the sea goddess or something like that, like over Zoom or something like that. And so thinking about, I don't know, ways to kind of bring to life um, so much of what I've explored in the book has been really fun as well. Yeah. Nikita. Oh, I really, um, I'm, I'm just want to put this out there. All of your books sound so amazing. I can't wait to kind of hold them in my hands and read them and just spend days with them. And like, they, they just sound brilliant. So it's really lovely to have this panel and this conversation. But I think for me, the first thing that, um, when my first book came out, um, it was because poetry can be can leave you really vulnerable um i think it was just it, it what was really exciting was knowing that people were going to hold my book for the first time and that people were going to read my book and there'd be straight like people across the world that was the weird bit people i had never met before in my life were going to be reading this really personal stuff which i was writing and and that you know it, it, it's a it does two things to you. On one hand, you're just like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. And the other one is like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. So it's like both at once, which is, <laughs> um, but it, it, I think it was an amazing, amazing experience to know that, yeah, you know, because when people start writing to you and start saying, you know, I don't know you, but, but when you wrote this particular line or this poem, it, it changed the way that I looked at my life or it changed the way that I did something. and And that, that is such a humbling experience. And, and you know, that, that was the thing that made me go, yeah, I think what I do, I feel like is, is the thing that I'm meant to do. Yeah, that's, that's how I feel. Yeah. Uh, for me, when I was a, a debut author, um, I, it, it had already been uh, a, a very long time coming. Uh, I, I didn't get published until I was 39. So I, I had been dreaming about it since I was 19. So that was a nice, you know, 20 year wait, um, you know, for me to get published. Uh, a lot of writing in between, lot, lots of failure. Uh, but, you know, th that wound up being all uh, the sweeter once I finally got my first book and I got that tactile sensation of getting to hold it in my hand. You unbox the author copies. It was so awesome. I loved it. You know, and, and it, it was just not just holding it and going, Ooh, look how pretty. It was like smelling the, the ink and the glue and the paper, right? You're like, mm, paper dust. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I that. relate. So uh, the, I still remember that. It's one of my most powerful memories of, of just holding my book in a physical form in my hand for the first time. And um, that's so awesome. And I'm, and I'm excited for all of you guys who are going to be debuting very soon. And I can't wait, like Nikita said, I can't wait to read your books. It's going to be awesome. And everybody at home is going to order or pre-order them. I know. <laughs> um, what is your top piece of writing advice for aspiring writers or alternately, alternatively, what is the worst piece of writing advice that you can ever remember receiving? Ooh. I think the number one thing to, uh, you know, there's good advice is just finish 
your work. <laughs> you know, finish that story uh, because until you do, you can't edit it. You can't move on to the next story, really. Um, you have to know that you are capable of writing a novel. It, it took me the longest time just to get that far. My first book, when I finally finished it, was absolutely terrible. And, and it will never be published. But what I learned from that was so valuable that A, I can write a book and B, I can do it better next time because I made all of these mistakes and I don't have to repeat them. So uh, I think that that is the best advice. If you are a person who is, you know, kind of beginning the process, please just, just finish your story so that you know what it feels like and what it takes and then you will have the confidence to do it well after that and faster. I, I have my writing time uh, once I knew that I could get this done. Such a confidence booster. How about you, Akimi? Oh yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful advice. Um, I, I once had a professor named Yuna Chung who told me oh, being a writer isn't an identity, it's a practice. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> I was like, oh my God. And I definitely don't think that means you have to like write 1000 words a day or, or anything like that. But it, I feel like it made me think too of like going toward to the page and it's almost like prayer. Like you have no idea what, whether that thing will actually manifest into something. You know, you write a sentence like, but it's just that practice of just returning and returning and returning. And it doesn't necessarily have to accumulate into anything. It doesn't have to end up being part of a project or anything like that. But um, it's, it's something that you do and that you practice. And I, I really love that. On one hand, I was like, oh, no. And then on the other hand, I was like, oh, but there's a kind of comfort in that, too, because there, um, it's OK if you like completely fail, too, because it's it's a practice for yourself. No one has to ever look at it. Um, uh, and that was really important for me to hear. Yeah. And that is really important advice. And my piece of advice kind of piggybacks off that, which is don't force it. Don't make yourself write a thousand words a day, because if you force it, you're not going to like the results. Um, I know that not all of us are able to like sit down and write right when the inspiration hits. Maybe you're at work or you're like on a hike and you can't just sit down and write. But, but to have that like you know, to, to write when you're inspired and not like, oh, guess I got to write a thousand words today and I'm not inspired. So it's going to be junk. Like, I think that's really important too, is to like give yourself a break sometimes. For me, it's, it's always been, so it's, it's two pieces of advice, which I got and they have really resonated and stayed with me. And the first one was be brave with it. It is, your voice is so important and the brave thing that you can do is sit down and write the thing which is hurting you which is making you vulnerable because what you're doing is you aren't the only person who's had that experience you are being able to speak to somebody who's probably not doesn't have it in them to write it down so when you write your story be brave with it your voice is so important there are there are so many things inside you that you need to give a voice to. Just be brave with it. And the second thing which I was taught was sit with it for a while. Like just sit with your writing for a while. Don't, don't be in a hurry to like post it or share it. And this is something I did like quite a lot when I was younger. I used to just post it or share it before it was ready. And the thing is, you, you can't do that. It's like, you know, like how you wait for a cake after you've taken a cake out, you don't immediately eat it because it's too hot. You have to sit with it and wait for it to cool and then you ice it and then you eat it. And that's it. That's what I learned with my writing. You sit with it like you would, would with a cake and you just let it percolate and you see if you can do it better. And if it is that, that is what you want to say. So that those are the two pieces of advice. That's great. Um, I'm going to ask one last question, which is going to be about a book recommendation. But before that, I want to thank everybody so much for joining me. You're all so fascinating and your books are wonderful. And I also want to thank Brian, who has been our ASL interpreter, and I'm sure he's done a wonderful job. And um, we thank him so much for being here. So my last question for everybody will be, um, a book recommendation for readers, what either a direct work of mythology or retelling have you really enjoyed that we haven't mentioned on this panel um, and that you think readers would enjoy? I'll call on Kevin first. 
Um, let's see. I, I, I was, I was all set with a recommendation for a book, but then you said it had to be mythology. And I was like, Oh no. Um, <laughs> Neil Gaiman, yeah. Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology of, of course is fantastic. I, I loved it. Um, and, uh, but it, I would recommend the 10,000 doors of January by Alex Harrow. Just fascinating, wonderfully, beautifully written book. And when I finished it, I was like, I was in public when I finished it and I was kind of doing the, one of those very happy cries and I was like, that was beautiful. You know, you're just sitting there weeping. And, and then this very nice lady was sitting next to me and she said, are you okay, sir? And I'm like, here, just, you know, and I gave it away uh, so that she could experience that too. And that's the, that's the kind of book it is. You just want to give it as a gift to somebody. So um, there's my recommendation for you. How about you, Nikita? Um, so I think for me, it is always this book, especially for people who want to learn about like Hindu mythology. And it is a book called Palace of Illusions by Chitra Banerjee Devakarani. It is a beautiful book. It is the story of the Mahabharat told from Draupadi, who is the one of the main female characters, or I would argue and say the main female character of the Mahabharat. And in fact, a lot of what happens in the Mahabharat is blamed on her. And because the Mahabharat is the greatest Hindu epic we have, it is a really great introduction to the Mahabharat. It's a, it's a retelling. It's told from a woman's perspective. It's very feminist. And it's just, it's, it's, so, um, it's so visceral and so powerfully written. So that's the book which I would recommend to everyone. How about you, Kimi? Uh, the book I want to recommend is actually the book that really inspired me to write, which I read, I think I read it in ninth grade. Um, and it is like the wildest book I have ever read and will ever pick up. Like after you're done, you're like, what is that? But it was so wonderful. But what was that? <laughs> which is Revenge of the Mooncake Vixen by Marilyn Chin. Uh, Marilyn Chin is a poet, but this is a novel, loosely a novel, <laughs> a novel in quotes, um, that kind of retells a bunch of Buddhist parables. Um, and like mind teasers, um, but it's also about these two sisters who grow up in a Chinese restaurant together. Um, and it feels like a myth and also so funny, so humorous and visceral too. Um, and it's just like absolutely kind of blows open what the possibilities of a novel can look like, yeah. Can you say the name again? Cause I, I missed it, it went a little bit too fast for me. Oh yeah, it's Revenge of the Mooncake Vixen <laughs> by Mary Lynn Chin. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, thank Wonderful you. Wonderful title. <laughs> yeah. Um, my yeah. recommendation would be um, The Mirror Wife by Maria Devana Headley. Um, I it's love a, that book. It's a feminist retelling of Beowulf, uh, a modern feminist retelling of Beowulf from the point of view of Grendel's mom. So it was exactly my cup of tea. Could not put it down. Highly recommend. That was, I love that book too. <laughs> well, again, thank you so much to everyone. And thank you so much to everyone at home and happy reading.